So really the definition of the failed back would be um, ongoing back or leg pain following spine surgery, a bit of a broad definition. And um, really, I think you can break, can break this down into sort of three components, either the wrong patient, wrong diagnosis, wrong procedure, or maybe the wrong surgeon. And um, it's probably just surgeon failure in the sense that, um, you know, you've, you failed to select the correct patient for the procedure, you failed to diagnose or you failed to execute. So it's really probably all, all the surgeon. But you, I think it's quite useful to think in terms of, if you're gonna answer a question on this around the patient factors, around the diagnostic factors and about the actual procedure. So that'd be the approach. But uh, we're gonna take a broader view on this. Um, so I'm just gonna discuss some basic science around pain and then discuss an approach to persistent post-op spinal related pain. So I think, you know, uh, failed, although we're talking about the failed back, um, you know, it, it, it's obviously something that as a surgeon, you're going to be faced with whatever uh, conditions you're treating or whatever subdiscipline you're in. And um, and you need to learn to deal with it because you are going to fail. And, and one needs to understand that. And you are going to work with pain. So these issues are really sort of more uh, wide, they're, they're wider aspects than just spinal, spinal issues. So it's just a simple graph of, of how you need to think as well. So, you know, as you go on with the patient and you perform more and more procedures on the same patient, um, your risks go up. Your patient often is more desperate than when you started, paradoxically. So the first operation is lots of discussion, but once you've wounded them, they're very keen to have more surgery because there's this belief that you're going to take away the, the terrible pain, which has been cured, caused by your surgery. And unfortunately, there's diminishing returns because the chance of success has become less and less. I think one needs to just stand back and you will get locked into these situations. You will see surgeons repetitively operating on the same patient and you will say like, what's going on? They're crazy. Obviously, they're never going to get this to work. They're trying the same thing or, you know, the patient's just poor substrate. You're never going to fix them or there's something wrong with their social aspects. They're just never going to, they don't want to get better or they can't get better. You're going to deal with some of those issues now. now. And uh, it's very obvious to you when you're not the surgeon, but if you are the surgeon and for some reason you get emotionally sucked in and you feel, you know, you've caused this trouble. I mean, unfortunately, we're all people. And when you operate on somebody, you sort of have an emotional bond with them and a sense of responsibility, even if you don't like it, it tends to happen. And your threshold to reoperate on them actually becomes lower than if you were looking at somebody else's complications. And I always find that a very interesting psychology. But just bear that in mind, um, you know, where you need to be broader than all of this to try and uh, think of it like that. So I want to talk a little bit about the physiology of pain. So obviously you get nociceptive stimulation, which is, you know, stimulate a nerve, you get pain. Then you've got non-nociceptive um, stimuli, which is environmental stress. These are just some, some terms that I'm going to use now for the next few slides. I'm just explaining them. So nociceptive, nerve pain, non-nociceptive environmental stress factors, hyperalgesia, which is an enhanced response to a stimulation. So in other words, you get an over-response. Um, and then um, allodynia, which is pain elicited by normal innocuous stimulants. In other words, you know, um, you scrape your hand across the top of a desk. You're aware that you're doing that, but it's not painful. But however, you may, something might happen to you that that normal sensation starts to create pain, and that would be termed allodynia. So there's a lot of um, studies in mice, actually, which actually intrigued me. If you want to look at these papers, I have them. But and that they use the mouse as a, as a model for, for looking at pain. So anyway, if you stress a mouse, however you stress the mouse, we get out. I'll give you some examples now. But if you create stress in the mouse, there's endogenous opioid release. Now, remember, the mouse is just a model, but we're just a big mouse. So the same thing happened to us. Um, so that that in that normal uh, stress response releases endogenous opioid, and the opioid will cause initial analgesia. But if it persists, then that long-term endogenous opioid release will cause increased pain, hyperalgesia, and allodynia, altered pain. So um, it's meant it's thought to be an evolutionary protective thing. So if you go and you know you go and break your leg, then you get an opioid uh, release, you go lie in the corner and um, it takes the pain away and, and your femur you, uh, heals. And then that same stimuli will give you increased pain so you stay away from that sort of um, stressor. 
So that'd be the idea. So now if you give exogenous opioids, so start to think about the patients that you're banging morphine into tonight in the eye care unit, for instance, Peter. So, um, so now you're giving uh, exogenous opioids, it creates analgesia, it starts to develop early tolerance and there's an increasing requirement. Now, so we all know about tolerance, we all know about regular um, receptor up and down regulation, but it's not only this, it's not only due to down regulation of the mu or the morphine or the opiate receptors. There's another pathway which I'm going to come to now. So for instance, in humans, we use a lot of, lot of fentanyl, which is a short acting opiate. And at three hours, it's only giving you a quarter of its peak effect. So within three hours, you are ready um, getting a poorer response to the drug. And this is a problem. You just think about a scoliosis operation where you're running uh, fentanyl intravenously. Within that same operation, your same dose of fentanyl is having a exponentially less effect. Now, initially, this was thought to be down, due to down regulation of the mu receptors, but yet the naloxone still acts. So it's, it shows you that the mu receptors are still present. It's unlikely to be that. And in fact, the Drug Administration recruits an, an opposing neurochemical system, which I'm going to come to. So, um, so tolerance is an increased pain sensitization, not a reduced opiate effectiveness. Okay, so something else is going on. And what's going on is this. So on the one side, you're giving the exogenous opiates, and that's uh, giving you analgesia. But on, there's another pathway, which is your N-methyl D-aspartate um, activation system. And um, that is causing the increased sense, uh, response of pain, allodynia, and anxiety. So that same opiate that's taking away pain on your mu receptor is driving the NMDA activation system, which increases your perception of pain and increases anxiety. And you'll see that. Is that you're going to get many patients in your private practice who get very get weird responses to tremor, for instance. I've had patients who get extremely anxious. They can't sleep at night because you put them on tremor. They get a heightened sympathetic drive as well. So you have to, you know, as you, you've been using a lot of um, opiates in your life, on your patients, hopefully, and, um, and you need to be aware of these, these effects. Now, we know that this pathway is, in, is important because you can use antagonists that actually, if you use antagonists against the NMDA, it reduces this hyperalgesia, um, in other words. So I don't want to spend too much time on the basic science, but more time on the effects which translate to how it affects our patients. So as I said, opiates create anxiety and they can be blocked. This, this anxiety can be blocked by NMDA antagonists. Um, and so it's interesting. Remember, I started off by talking about nociceptive and non-nociceptive. So non-nociceptive would be a social stressor. And it's interesting, baboons, so the higher ranking baboons in a troop, sort of the, the big shots, have lower stress hormones. Um, and subordinates in the troop have a higher resting uh, pulse rate and, and, and blood pressure. So they're more stressed. So the higher you're up, you're meant to be less stressed. I don't know quite if that's true in the human situation, but it is. the point is that there are social stresses that uh, invigorate physiological effects. Now, you can use these social stresses such as uh, altering the rat's or mice cage in terms of litter and light, you can force them to swim, and that in releases endogenous steroids, which gives you the acute analgesia and the longer term hyperalgesia. So, if you create stress, you drive this M NMDA activation, creates those properties which I've spoken about already. And you can induce this with simple things by just putting them in a new cage, putting a light on so they can't sleep. And a very interesting one I find is social defeat. So if you take a big rat and you put it in the cage of the small rat, that small rat will exhibit um, NMDA activation. And you just think about failed back surgery, just to try and give you some relevance, you think I'm not crack cracking up here. But a failed surgery, every time you have an operation, you fail, there's social defeat. And that's going to have a physiological effect on the way we drive our NMDA activation system, which influences the way we perceive pain. And remember, at the end of the day, we're treating pain. So it doesn't help to just operate if actually the surgery, the pain has lost its link with the actual physiological side of things. So how do we block this NMDA? It's very interesting. You can block it with ketamine and nitrous oxide. And you'll see that many of the multimodal pain protocols now are using ketamine and there's a big drive to try to for opiate sparing to try and get away from that um, the opiates driving the NMDA activation system. So this is where 
multimodal pain uh, management's coming from. So just be aware of this when you're thinking about managing your patients. And I find this extremely interesting. So they've done a lot of studies on, on and this can be the last, I think, basic science thing, a lot of studies on, on rats where you inject a irritant, a uh, carrageenan into the paw, and then you squeeze the paw, and by the certain amount of pressure you put on the paw, the mouse squeaks, basically, when it gets a certain amount of pain. And obviously, if you inject an irritant into the paw, it squeaks earlier when you give it a squeeze. So then what they went and did, and they, they went and gave some of these uh, rats fentanyl, they exposed them to fentanyl. So if you take uh, rats, naive, naive rats, in other words, they've never seen an opiate, and you give them a, an anti uh, an opiate, they'll have analgesia for a period of time. <clears throat> if you add naloxone, as you know, it's an anti mu receptor um, effect, so then there's no analgesia because you're blocking the effect of that opiate. If you expose the rats to fentanyl 13 days prior and then inject their paw and give them a squeeze, they have a heightened response to that pain. So that earlier fentanyl exposure drives the NMDA pathway and they will have a higher pain experience when exposed to pain. So now just think of that. So if you our patients have been a lot of our patients are exposed to opiates and if they then experience pain, they're going to explain they're going to experience that pain at a much higher magnitude than the naive rats would have. And obviously if you inject a uh, carrageenan earlier they also the pain risk the, the, the fact that they've had pain before they have hyperalgia they have a great ex response to pain later when exposed to pain and if you combine the effects of carrageenan in other words causing pain early exposure to, to fentanyl and then do a pain stimuli they have much higher experience of pain so th this really just mimics what we do to our patients so if you have a patient with a failed surgery They've been exposed to some sort of trauma, our trauma antigenic. They've been exposed to opiates because we've treated them with that. And then each time they come back for more surgery or just other stimuli, they're going to have a massive pain response. So we just need to bear this in mind. And then you just start to realize that the solutions are not always surgical once you get into this sort of circle. So and this would apply to just about all the, the areas of, of orthopedics and so on. And that means we need to be careful what drugs we're using because the drugs we use a lot, such as fentanyl and remifentanyl, are pure mu antagonists. And we maybe should consider other types of opiates, but we don't actually have them readily available for risk here. So that's a bit of a problem. But um, COX inhibitors, so our, in, our NSAIDs actually block the NMDA hyperalgesia. And that's why the addition of anti inflammatories in your multimodal pain program um, is quite helpful. And in spinal surgery, we've tended to stay away from anti-inflammatories because of our concerns about uh, blocking fusion. I think on the balance of probability, it's far better to give anti-inflammatories early and not worry too much about its effect on fusion, which is not really strongly associated. And I would I use quite a lot of COX-2 inhibitors now around the time of surgery to um, as a, to to be have opiate sparing and to to block the NMDA pathways. And then the other thing. Um, we don't use much nitrous because I like spinal, I use spinal cord monitoring a lot, so I can't really use the nitrous oxide, but ketamine is very useful um, to block this NMDA pathway. So you can see when the needles talk about a multimodal pain relief, um, this is a reason why. There's actually very good science why we should be doing this. So just bear that in mind when you're trying to control difficult patients in terms of pain. Uh, something slightly left field, but I really like this totally um, underpowered uh, study. But this is a paper from uh, 1984 where they basically compared patients that were having cholecystectomies uh, that were put in a room with a view and other one that didn't have a view. And it's amazing, the ones that had a view uh, that could see trees as opposed to concrete wall, that is shorter to stay, lower analgesic use, and less negative nursing comments. Um, and again, you know, at the moment, you don't, you're not exposed to these things. But once you're in private practice, you'll have patients requesting certain rooms. It's not infrequent when you have a patient. I've got a patient at the moment who's been in hospital for some weeks now with, with sepsis and so on. And they request these things, you know, a room with a view type of thing. And it, it, there is evidence that you improve the, um, the experience. So don't, don't scoff at it. These things are, are very valuable. And not only do they reduce the uh, pain and so on, but they also with that, uh, those positive effects are going to be less likely to sue you. Okay, so now um, just some of my comments that I made briefly and I started. Um, the first operation is only one not indicated. They are, they are you all have good indications, a bit of a joke in spinal surgery, but often that first operation when you go back in a patient that's 
uh, in trouble, you'll see there was a really iffy indication, but clearly once you've got sepsis, instrumentation failure, non-union, you have very good reasons to operate. And I think one must be very careful why you are revising somebody. And again, this is not only spinal surgery, but are you operating because your ego has been hurt and you failed in your primary operation? You've got to, you know, you've got to say what is bothering the patient. Will my next operation have a high chance of sorting that out? It shouldn't be just chasing a slightly misposition screw or a slightly loose screw. If that is not really a, the cause of the patient's symptomatology, there's no point that doing that revision operation. And I always think the test is whether it's my patient versus his patient, because I see this so often. When it's your patient, you've got a very low tolerance to, a very low threshold to go reoperate. You feel somehow emotionally bound to, to dive in and help this patient despite all odds, whereas it's very easy to get a, a patient from somewhere down the drag from uh, from another patient, the another practice, and just say, look, clearly the first operation was indicated. Clearly the second operation is not going to work. The patient's nuts. Um, send them on somewhere else. So uh, you know, just just bear that in mind when you when you make those decisions. Um, you can also be pressurized. Often the family on on you. You know, you the guy that took the patient to hospital. You're the one that did the hip replacement or the spinal operation. You've caused the problem. There's a lot of pressure on you to fix the problem. And we also see this. I was just in a medical legal meeting today with a with a guy in, in Dubai, actually a surgeon in Dubai, who did three operations on a patient. And I mean, he clearly wasn't up to the first one. Never mind the difficulties of revision. And he didn't ask for help. And you often get pressurized and embarrassed into these things. And I think you must just um, stand back, take a big breath and shout for help. Um, so really, when you approach um, somebody that's got a failed procedure, you need to have a clear assessment of what the problem is. Can it, and can it realistically be solved with surgery? Um, we don't, you know, the, that law of diminishing returns is, is, is very important, as, as um, I pointed out earlier. Uh, so see how one of you guys what's happening to me. No. Oh, Beyonder, load shedded. Okay, she's she's gone off. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So, what is the approach to persistent post-op pain? Now, given some of you guys' cases, you're just going to have to remind me who's got what because I just flew them off last night or this morning. Um, so, I think when you approach a spine patient with persistent post-op pain, you really want to think about timing. In other words, when did the pain occur? Did the pain, you know, is it, is it the case that the, the, the pain was there immediately on waking? Did the pain start a few days later um, or, did, or even longer? Because obviously if you go put a pedicle screw through a nerve root, you'd expect that patient to wake up with agony. And if the patient was absolutely comfortable for three or four days and then starts to get some leg pain, obviously something may have changed in terms of the instrumentation move, but that's usually quite unlikely. Um, and it's more likely that you may have a neuritis from some intraoperative manipulation or like from the interbody fusion where you do quite a lot of manipulation of the nerve root. So I would, you know, if somebody wakes up with incredible pain, I'd, have a, I'd be very aggressive in dealing with that. Uh, however, if somebody has fine and they four or five, they start to get a bit of an ache in the calf, I think more along the lines of neuritis and I'd probably be relatively conservative and see if it'll settle down. You also want to think about is it is it back or radicular? And that means is it axial spine or is it radicular in the distribution of a nerve root? Because again, you know, if, if you've got a new onset leg pain in the L5 nerve root, you've got to think very seriously, did I put a screw there? Did I, did I bang the screw near the nerve root? But if it's back pain, um, that's different. Uh, it's unlikely to be a, you know, a nerve that's irritated. It's, it's more likely to be either an instability. You haven't, something's gone wrong with the instrumentation. Maybe it's an osteoporotic patient and your screws have just pulled out or that sort of thing. And then I think you've got to look at the patient's psychological state. I mean, um, many patients are psychologically challenged um, and they may be selecting themselves out. You know, we all get pain. Um, and uh, I sometimes think to myself, you know, I've got a patient sitting in front of me that's now I'm considering doing an operation. And sometimes I think I get more back or leg pain than that bloke after a long operation. You know, why does this guy want an operation? And you, you just need to think that through that a little bit, you know, what makes that patient select themselves out? Um, we all get back pain. Why is this one begging for an operation? And the other thing is, you know, obviously chronic pain does put you into psychological 
uh, disquiet and uh, all the impact of that if you lose your job because you can't work and, and and so on you can imagine that creates quite a lot of stress so but I think one has to think through these things through because if it's the psychological state that's the primary problem then it's unlikely your operation is going to fix it and maybe you need to look at um, other more effective ways of the, dealing with the psychology of the patient or the socioeconomics even if it's just recognizing it okay so let's look at timing so if the patient wakes up with the same pain, so that you operated for right leg pain, L5 distribution, and the patient still got that pain, um, then you've got to think, well, did I make the wrong diagnosis? And I mean, I've, I've got one of those at the moment where I was told the hip was fine. She had this pain, it was a bit L5-ish. The MRI scan showed a full five uh, um, stenosis. I did the operation. And the pain's still there. And now it looks very obviously like it's the hip, even though the x-ray looks pretty normal. Uh, but she may have some sort of labral tear or something. So maybe my diagnosis is wrong. You have to consider that. And we all can make these errors a lot of the time when making a diagnosis. I mean, it is pro probability-based. And sometimes the probability is against you. So even though it's 90%, it would have been what you think it was. There's always that 10% or 15% chance of something else. And bang, you know, it's just the way it falls sometimes. And you may have done the wrong procedure. So you might have totally cocked it up. You might have operated the wrong level or something, but you may have you may have misassessed the situation. So just think, so if the patient's not better, you've, just, you've got a diagnosis, you do the operation, patient's not better, you've either made the wrong diagnosis, you've done the wrong procedure. Um, so the wrong, you might, you might have, for the wrong diagnosis example, might be you missed the foramenal stenosis. You thought there was lateral recess stenosis, but you didn't notice actually that the actual foramen is very really tight. Or it's a non spinal cause of pain, like I said, it could be the hip or something else. Um, and then I think, you know, if, if you're a little unsure, don't just dive in again. Get a second opinion, ask a mate to have a look at the patient. Um, we spend a lot of time showing our cases on our Tuesday morning meeting. It just gives you an ability to listen to other people, see it without your emotionally charged involvement, possibly reinvestigate. It is problematic, it's expensive, or it takes a long time, it's really scary, you're not gonna wait another six months for MRI, but don't just dive in. You, you, if you're gonna go back, you want high probability of improvement. Okay, so the wrong procedure could be the wrong level, and I mean, um, that happens not infrequently. I mean, it's, it's a never, it's a, it should be a never event, but um, I think 3.5% incidence of wrong level surgery or wrong side surgery. And obviously, you might do an incomplete decompression. So you go and, um, uh, you know, you, you think you've done a decompression of the nerve and you just haven't done it well enough. I mean, we all have bad days and, uh, you know, it is a subjective thing at times. You look at the nerve root, you probe out with your pedicle, with your little uh, Watson chain, you think there's space, you've got it wrong, you know. So, I mean, we're all human. Um, if the patient wakes, so that was same leg pain. If the patient wakes up with new leg pain, I mean, there's nothing more distressing than that. You know, they come in with left leg pain, they wake up now, they've got right leg pain, it's a bit embarrassing. Anyway, you have to, you, you can't hide. So you've got to consider instrumentation misplacement. So if you put pedicle screws in, I think that's the immediate thought must be. And I had one of those in um, Namibia some years ago. I did a lytic lysesis and a big fat lady really battled with the screws. L5 screws are always really difficult in a lysesis, especially in a fat lady. And... I was right doing my notes, having a cup of coffee, and I could hear this woman screaming from the recovery room. It was quite clear this was like serious pain. My niece didn't call me. He banged her with 10 milligrams of morphine. By the time I stood up, the second 10 was in. So she had 20 milligrams of morphine. She was all scree screaming like a banshee. I just said, and I was working with Alex van der Horst, I said, I went and checked her. It was pain down the right leg. I said, listen, taking her back. Didn't even do a CT scan. I just took her back, opened her up. And I found my L5 screw totally cut out inframedially in the pedicle, five nerve roots strapped around it and going around, moved my screw, woke her up an hour later, she was absolutely fine. So, you know, you, you, you can't, uh, you need to just, really, you know, just take it on the chin when these things happen. Um, so obviously, as I said, if the pain develops a few days later, especially if it's on the side of your interbody fusion, it may well be from the neuritis or the retraction to get the cage in. It becomes less frequent when you become more skilled. But in the early days, you take quite a long time and you have um, new fellows, the registrar is a bit heavy on the retraction. Um, you can cause neuritis and it's not infrequent up to about one in eight patients will have uh, neuritis after TDF. And um, of course, it may be hidden. You always have your morphine honeymoon. So 
those first two or three days, the patient's on zonked out and all this stuff. You might have done a myofascial block. You might have done an epidural injection at the same time or interest, I do an intrathecal opiate. So, you know, you don't get the pain, but after you get them up and going, you then start to get the pain. You may have failure of instrumentation, something might cut out, and you, of course, infection comes between day four and seven as well. So that slight delay, you just got to think about all those things. Okay, so let's just uh, get some cases. Uh, those um, names don't mean anything today. I think that's from last time. But Kruni, did I give you one? Yes, Prof. Okay, let me see if I can just... Um... Are you seeing the new PowerPoint? Or are you still seeing the old one? Prof, I'm still seeing case one, case two, case three on okay, the screen. Let just, yeah, okay, let me just change this. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just thought I'd give it to the registrar. So there's just somebody with a bit of a heads up if there's something to be asked. Uh, so let's just go. So this is a 69-year-old man. Uh, previous L4 to S1 fusion. He's got increasing right leg and perineal pain. And that's his x-ray um, at the time. You can see he's had an L4 to S1 fusion, very old technique. But anyway, it was done some time ago. And quite clearly, he's got an L3-4 degeneration, anterior osteophytes, retrolysis. Okay. Uh, you can quite clearly see the um, myelogram in those days. It was, we used myelogram if we had metal, especially stainless steel screws, because you couldn't get a good MRI around those things. It quite clearly shows the stenosis in the dye there. Uh, so I took those screws out and I've gone and done a L3-4 T-lift some years ago. There's a very, very old set. That's a click X. So that puts this back probably 15 years ago. I did this case. Um, he's a bit of a sort of moaning old gent. But anyway, this is what happens. You always blame your patient first. And uh, so he was slow to mobilize. Day three post-op, he complains of right quadricep pain to the knee. So right quads anterior, it's pop, you know, we think about an L3. Okay, Khrini, so what did you think of the CT scans? Could you come on so I can feel like I'm not alone here? Thanks. Can you hear me, Prof? Yeah, okay, now you are. Prof, so um, we can see the, the the actual cuts um, of the CT scan and what caught my attention immediately, I um, I think this is the, yeah, this must be L3 vertebral body. You can see the right-sided pedicle screw. There's some breach um, where, where it goes through the right pedicle. Um, so that was concerning. And then also um, just to confirm that finding on the coronal cuts that you also gave me, you can, it just basically amplifies what I said now. You can see that that L3 um, right-sided pedicle screw, there's yeah. breach through the pe pedicle cortex. So that was concerning. Um, and that most likely is the explanation for the radicular pain that the patient is experiencing in his knee. Yeah, good. So yeah, so it's not rocket science, but you got to go look for it. Um, I mean, this is not the worst looking pedicle screw, but obviously that would be a better one. And you can see it looks like it's pushed the bone in. So the thread's not terribly visible. And the reason this guy probably didn't manifest his pain, first of all, there's a bit of the opiate holiday, but you can imagine that you see there's a flake of bone that's just been pushed off over there. And what happens is the nerve root runs around that pedicle and out. So the presence of that screw is usually not a problem. I've had screws that push into the canal and, you know, we put hooks in, which take up the equivalent of 2.5 millimeters medial breach of a screw in terms of volumetric change. But this fragment of bone is sharp and the nerve root comes around. And remember when you move your leg, that nerve root goes up and down, up and down. So what tends to happen, the nerve root comes out as you stretch leg and goes back and it just hooks on that piece of bone. And I've had three of these where this has happened and I've gone in there and I just found this flake of bone and I've just peeled that flake of bone off, often just put a bit of wax will certainly sell around the screw threads and the pain's gone. So it's really that, and that's the problem. You make a hole with it all, you palpate, you think you're okay, you put the screw in and, and, and it bursts in. So anyway, that that was, um, that's all we wanted to show in that case. So that's an example of a, of a pedicle screw issue. Um, let's see if I can get, uh, who did I give case two to? 
Prof, I think it was me. Um, the, Who's that? Uh, it's actually, yeah, case two. Post yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, okay. Let me just uh, share this thing again. Um, okay, so there's also a post op leg pain. So this guy's a 29 year old, low back pain, predominantly left L5 symptoms, started on the right. His x rays confirmed a diminished L5 S1 disc height. He had some medic one changes at L5 S1 normal disc at the other levels. Uh, he was a big guy. He actually was one of the officers from the Merchant Sea. sea. He was dry, uh, sailing big ships around the world, moving stuff. Came down to Cape Town to have his operation. And I did his, I did a post-year L5 S1 T lift. You see how you always write these things. You blame the patient. He had extreme wound site pain from waking, required industrial dose of opiates and raison. I mean, I, you, know, you see the guy, thought, yes, big, tough bloke. Next minute, you're like, <laughs> having to uh, give him lots of uh, uh, drugs. Large anxiety component. I remember his mother came and sat by his bedside. It was all a little bit odd. Uh, gave some anti anxiolytics. And then once that settled down by day four, he started to mobilize and he did acute onset of right leg pain down the calf. His original pre-op left leg pain had totally resolved and this was new pain. So this is always embarrassing. Left pain's gone, right pain's now there. He's just traded pain. Uh, initially I thought maybe just some irritation, pretty much Lyrica wasn't working. And just to the point is, I just wanted to say uh, difficulty with S1 convergence due to tight pelvis. He had a typical male pelvis, and I put a slightly shorter S1 screw. Those were my notes at the time. So, what did you think, Ashley? So, Prof, uh, looking at the right uh, S1 pedicle screw, uh, I think uh, it's angled slightly laterally. So, likely reason for his pain is uh, it's impinging on the L5. Uh, nerve root, so the yeah. yeah exactly. So you can see this. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's lit, a, a little bit. I mean, you're being kind. Yeah, I mean, this is directly okay. dead straight. It's pretty shit screw. Yeah, um, it obviously should be there. But you can see this guy, this big deep pelvis here, and you try and put the screw. It's just very, very difficult to get that angle. Um, but anyway, so he was out laterally and anteriorly, and this is exactly where the L5 nerve root runs anterior to the sacrum. So that's why this guy had the terrible pain. So two. Cases in my own hands, and there are plenty out there of these type of things where the pedicle screws are close to nerve roots. So we just went to reposition that. I think I nibbled away some of the posterior crest, put a screw in, pain was gone. So it's all my fault, not his fault. Okay, Ashley, well done. Um, it's me, Bayanda. I'm case three. Are uh, you back? Um, You're not load shedded. Okay, let me. I, uh, I am load shedded. It's just um, dedication, Prof. This is what oh, you call dedication. Okay. Okay, well, let me just get your case up and share it. Um, okay, so beyond, uh, okay, so this is quite an interesting one. So it's also post-op leg pain. So just three different causes of it. Oh, I see you like a seance here. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, 2008, 55-year-old woman, seronegative arthropathy, diabetic, she had back and left L5, nerve root pain. As you can see there, she had a big, nice disc at 4.5. Yeah. And I went and did yeah. a T-lift back then. She was fine for six years. She returns with increasing groin pain. And funny enough, she's also a load-shedding story, which I'll get to now. The new MRI confirmed L2, 3, disc degeneration, L3, 4, stenosis with rhesus. I did a posterior revision L2 to 4 decompression instrumented fusion and T-lift. Following transfer to the ward, there was some difficulty mobilizing her right buttock. And then the load shedding story is I had to cancel her surgery, the surgery because the, there was load shedding and we weren't allowed to start a case with the generators running at Constantinburg. And then I had to go do it two nights later at seven o'clock. And then I got this complication, which you're about to see. And then she wanted, she wrote a letter of health to the Health Prevention Council to complain about me because I refused to operate during load shedding. And that I was tired when I did her um, on the night. And that's why she got the complication. She may have been right, but she was from PE and I felt desperately sorry she was lying in the hospital, which is why I did it. So load <laughs> shedding has massive consequences. I and mean, sadly, this is probably about eight or 10 years ago. So it's been going a long time. But anyway. So following transfer to the ward, there was some difficulty mobilizing her due to right buttock and lateral thigh pain, as well as marked weakness of the right quadriceps, okay? So just mm -hmm. bear that in mind. So you've got weakness of the right quadriceps, you had a five. And there's one uh, 
And there's your okay. So what do you so what do you think about that story? What nerve root are you thinking? So um so you say she's got right butt talk um pain and lateral thigh. So that would be the higher uh, nerve root. So it would be at least an L2. Two, well, what supplies the quadriceps? Um, I, was, I think I was confused. Sorry. Uh, so it's an L3 form. Three or four, eh? Three or yeah. four, probably. But then she okay. also has this right buttock, which yes. threw me off a bit. So okay, I wasn't but, really yeah. sure. Okay. So do you see anything on these? So you got your L2, 3, 4, 5. Any concerns around those screws? So I was happy with the um, was happy with L4. Happy with um, uh, L5. I, I don't see the full screw on L5. Uh, no, L3, I think you know, L5, L5, you could say maybe is a bit medial. But yeah. My, uh, but I'd say... Oh, but so, what, so what do you think about that? I mean, could it be yeah, alpha? But then, but then, but then she's got quads, quads weakness. So that's why I was like, okay, L five quads, uh, not it, it's not correlating. It's a little bit doesn't too correlate. Low. Plus, L five screws were put in in two thousand and eight, and she had no problem yeah. for six years from those screws. The new screws are at L two and three. So, um, looking at L two, can't see the full um, lift left screw on L2, but the right screw looks like it's central. Um, mm. The left one looks a little bit um, lateral. I can't, uh, I can't see the full screw, it looks a little bit lateral, but the right one looks like it is central. It doesn't seem to be breaching the cortex um, on the left or the right. And the L3, however, um, the left one uh, seems to be breaching the, the cortex and the right, um, uh, I thought the right looked fine, Prof. Yeah, funny. You know, actually, when I looked at these, I thought all these screws are fine except L5. L5 okay. looked a little bit medial, but L5 screws had been there for six years without a problem, so they wouldn't have become a problem now. You know, first of all, so you get up to ten percent magnification of the of, because of the artifact on the screw is okay. well recognised that your screws look ten percent bigger. So you've got to be cautious when you call, call a CT screw medial. And I think if you look at the sp shape of the canal, as opposed to that one with Huni showed us, it looks like it's nice and symmetrical and round. It's not like it's riding off that corner like we saw earlier. I mean, I think that is a problem. There. Well, not a problem. That's definitely really violated, but insignificant because it didn't cause problem back then. And, and it's, unless it's loose, it's not going to cause problems now. But the problem was after I did the new operation. So the, the, salute, the answer is here. Did you see the answer? <laughs> I did not see the answer. I was looking for yeah. fractures. Mm -hmm. So this is a thing. No one sees the answer. In fact, I've had two or three of these in the past, and they have never been reported by the radio. They've been never been identified by the radiologist. So when you're in practice one day, remember you are responsible for looking at your own imaging. You cannot wash your hands of these things. If you are the Spine surgeon, you need to be able to look at your CTs. And if you are a hip surgeon, whatever, you have a problem, you look at your hip x-rays. You can't rely on a non-orthopedic surgeon because you can see here, 4-5 is has not changed. I've done that ages ago. So you but what has changed? If you look at the foramen of 3-4, look at the mm -hmm. foramen of 2-3. You see how big the foramen ah, is. If you look okay. at the foramen of 3-4. What have I done? I have retro deceased L3 yes. relative to L4. The superarticular facet of L4 has driven into the thing. And so the nerve root is there and the nerve root is there. And what's happened is I pulled L3 back and the, okay. the superarticular process has gone bang in. And all I did is I took her back. I stuck her up cut into there. I grabbed that superarticular process, nibbled it out, woke up, pain was gone. Okay. Happy as Larry until two years later when her husband got retrenched and she wrote a letter of complaint about to health professions council about me. But luckily she also complained about the guy carrying her bags and made a lot of noise, so they just threw it out. But um, anyway, it just shows you. But that, look for that. You can see there. Um, always look at the coronal, all the coronal and the uh, social views. But the, the, these... Um, these are absolutely all fine. The screw placement was not a problem. I retroly see three on four narrowed down that frame, and that was a problem. And then when you, that's why you learn from these things. And now I, I'm very cautious about palpating in that space and, and checking that that doesn't happen. Okay, okay. thank you, Brianda. 
All right, so we can move on in the presentation. Um, just share again. So you should be seeing case, should we see timing weeks to months later now? Um, and obviously, if there's a problem weeks to months later, have you got a recurrent disc? If you've done a discectomy, um, you've got a you know four to eight percent chance of recurrence of the disc. Maybe that's happened, or have you got an infection? Okay, so just so once you get to two weeks to months, it's recurrent pathology or, or infection. Just think along those lines. So I think that's quite a useful way of approaching um, onset of leg pain in terms of timing. Um, obviously, if it's years later, you know, you're dealing with pseudothrosis, again, could be infection, scar tissue, which I think is a, we bl people blame it, but it's a very Solomon issue, or superjacent pathology, which we'll come to later. Um, so that was timing. Then the other thing to look at would be, is it back versus leg pain? So if it's back, if it's axial, it's going to really be, is it mechanical instability, is it an infection? If it's leg pain, it's, it's usually a nerve compression. So this brings us to adjacent level disease. Um, and this really is why people joke about, you know, once a spinal patient, always a spinal patient, because when you fuse the spine, it translates the forces to the level above that will break down in time and may return for surgery. So adjacent level degeneration is a very broad term, and it, in its broadest term denotes, denotes any radiological and more latterly an MRI change at the adjacent level to a fusion. And the literature, if you look at it, uses terms like disc degeneration, lysesis, instability, hypertrophic facets, herniated disc, stenosis, osteophyte formation, scoliosis, or compression fracture. All those terms denote, denote uh, degenerative change. So, so that is adjacent level degeneration. So adjacent degeneration with symptoms is adjacent level disease. So there's a distinction when people write about these things. So we every patient that has a fusion will develop adjacent level degeneration. I mean, the instance approach is 100%. The question is, are they symptomatic? And if they're symptomatic, we would call it adjacent level disease. Um, and then once they do that, they typically present with radiculopathy, neurogenic claudication, and axial pain. Um, so as I said, you know, the, most people will develop degeneration, so it approaches 100%, whereas the incidence of, of actually symptomatic disease presenting to you as a surgeon is that maybe up to 20% or one-fifth of them. It all depends how long they live. Um, and there's some papers on this, of course, that new disease might be about 4% per annum, according to this guy. And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of his data where... 83% uh, of people with a fusion or disease free at five years, years but only 63% 10 years. So you can see sequentially over time, people will develop symptoms related to adjacent de disease. Now, however, other guys like the Sate Salo guy, he looked at children with lysesis that had a fusion or no fusion, found no difference in the group of fusion, no fusion. So it depends what you're being fused for. And that always amazes me. You know, we, I've almost never, I think I've had one patient now that we had to fuse down for pelvis who came to me with a very low scoliosis. But of all the scoliosis patients that I've operated on in the last 20 years, I mean, it's about 800 or 900 of them. And then Dr. Gillem de Toy, one of my mentors, he was probably the only guy that operated scoliosis in Cape Town before me. I've never received his patients come to me for revision surgery for the super Jason. So it's interesting. So in the group of young, fit, genetically strong patients, you don't seem to see degenerative change for, for, for post adjacent level. But obviously the people that come to you with low back pain, degenerative discs, they selecting themselves out as poor genes, maybe, maybe uh, poor environmental factors, maybe overweight. So you can see there's a, a pro selection process occurring and they're the ones that tend to keep coming back with more problems. But so maybe it's not only the fusion, maybe there is a subtype of patients that are just going to be in trouble with their spine. Um, so there's, you know, there's cadaveric, cadaveric studies and they've shown that there's a shift in the center of rotation after fusion. So there's biomechanical changes. When you step in one segment, it changes where the motion occurs and usually into the disc above. And there's increased stress at the superjacent facet. So there's other blokes who put little, little metal balls in and they've taken x-rays, movement x-rays, and show this relative hypermobility at the segment above. So we know increased force, increased motion at the level above. And we also know, by if you put catheters in it now, that there's going to be increased pressure. So increased motion, increased stress, and increased disc pressure at the level above a fusion. So, I mean, that pretty much tells us 
that this works harder. Um, and they've done that in a mouse tail, poor old mouse again. And, uh, and some guys do finite analysis. analysis. I must say, I, I'm very circumspect about finite element analysis. I always find it strange that you program a program to do something and you believe what it says, when, but you've told it what to say. So anyway, I, I don't really have much state. But anyway, if you do use finite analysis, it confirms these things. Um, and it's been shown in sheep models. So if you do it in rabbits, uh, but funny enough in the goat, you did, couldn't create it. So anyway, but in some animals, you can create this super Jason business. Um, poor dog, yeah. But it is quite interesting. Here's a patient that I saw over a period of time. And this is her spine on going through time sequences. So just see what's happening here. So she develops a four, five, she's never had surgery. And so slowly she's getting degeneration. But had I chose to go fuse her four, five at that level, we would have blamed the four, five fusion for the three, four degeneration. Yet she never had surgery and she had a progressive degeneration. So as I was saying, certain patients might just have a predisposition to dis degeneration or facet degeneration. And irrespective of the surgery, they are going to degenerate above there. So, you know, is it really due to our fusion? Or is it due to the underlying uh, genetics uh, or environmental or socioeconomic factors? Probably both. And um, I think we probably do accelerate it with some of our, our surgery. Um, okay, so here's a patient, for instance, that I operated eventually. She had this L3 to S1 uninstrumented fusion, rock solid for 34 years before she got some breakdown over here. So even though she had a long fusion, you can see how well her discs were maintained because they were never loaded throughout her life. She actually lasted very, very long. So people seem to respond to these things in different ways. One would have never have predicted she would have lasted 34 years of that fusion. Um, okay, and she got, got a teeter. Um, we know that instrumentation um, is rigid and it, this study showed about 14% adjacent segment disease at four years and they blamed the instrumentation. Um, and that these other authors found on average of two years, they would see it after pedicle screws, but yet other guys say it never happens. I must say, Guillaume de Toy, my mentor, he looked at it the other way around, and he just looked at patients that came back to him for revision surgery. And if they had, a, and the ones that came back after a single level fusion tended to come back at around 15 years after the index operation. In those that came back with super adjacent degeneration that had two level operations, they tended to come back around seven years. So those are numbers I've got in my head from him. But that's not mean that that doesn't mean that everybody with a single level operation came back at 15 years. It just means those that came back that had had a previous fusion single level, they, they came back at 15 years. So we don't know what the denominator is. And um, I would say that. You know, we usually talk about if you, I, I quote my patients, if you have a single level fusion, you've got an 8% chance of another operation in a lifetime. It's, I don't know, that's my thumb suck for them. Um, but obviously, you've got to be careful. You can see here, so when you place pedicle screws, sometimes the guy's a little bit medial. If not careful, you can jam your head up against the um, facet joint, and that'll, of course, cause super adjacent degeneration. So when, you, when you're trying to avoid super adjacent degeneration, one must be very careful with your superior construct that you don't damage the facet joints at that level. And the other big issue around um, adjacent level degeneration is sagittal balance. So if you don't get the sagittal balance right, in other words, if you put the patient in a relative kyphotic position, in other words, you flatten their lumbar lordosis, they're likely to hyperlordose above your fusion rate and, and in stress and stress those facet joints. So there's a lot of work around sagittal balance. And if you're out of sagittal balance, you're more likely to have a failed spine in terms of adjacent segment degeneration. Poor old sheep, we'll leave it alone. Um, and there's some authors have found that the lowest incidence of, a, of adjacent segment disease is in those which are sagittally balanced. Okay. Um, and you can see that here, 43% uh, had malalignment and there was 77% um, were in kyphosis. So sagittal balance, higher chance of having it. Um, some guys, of course, will disagree. Uh, multi-level fusions is conflicting evidence some of you may have read about Hillebrand uh, do I get to Hillebrand your yeah, Hillebrand so Hillebrand so so most people say 
The more levers you fuse, the higher incidence of adjacent segment gene generation. This is all gelatin here. So you've got a 31, or well, let's just get to disease rather, 11% for one level, 27% for two levels, 33% for three and four levels, which makes sense. The longer your column that's stiff, the more stress is going to be on the higher one. But then Hillebrand comes along and he's talking about next though. He says, no, multi-level fusions had a lower incidence of superjacent degeneration than single level. And you, the only way you can explain this is because he's including the disc at risk. So you can imagine that if you've got a single level, if you operate a single level, but your second level is a little bit dodgy, then the stress on that second dodgy level is going to accelerate degeneration and he's probably going to come back with surgery. If you automatically say, well, that second level is a bit dodgy, I'm just going to include it, so I'm going to do a two-level fusion, well, then you might have a virgin normal disc at the level above it. So now you've done a two-level fusion, but you've got a normal disc above it. So the sort of way to understand Hillebrand stuff is the reason he's got a lower superjacent degeneration with multi-level is because he just included all the dodgy discs in his multi-level. So that's that's where the paradox comes from. Um, and then what about the impact of motion sparing? So now we've just, you know, the whole long time I've been hammering on about if you stiffen something, you increase this intradiscal pressure, you increase hypermobility, you increase the stress there. So if you can maintain motion, you know, there's been a disc, protect, a disc replacement in there which maintains motion, maybe it'll be better. And they've shown that. So these guys show that there's a non, um, in fact, these guys show that if you have a pseudothrosis, you have a lower incidence of adjacent segment disease. So there's ongoing motion. So that's interesting. So if you don't achieve union, despite trying, your incidence of, a, of adjacent segment disease is lower. And um, guys in, in underpowered studies have shown that with total disc replacement as well, although it's largely out the window now in the lumbar spine. But in sort of bad science papers, the, the total disc replacement had a much lower so uh, degenerative uh, uh, adjacent segment degeneration. You know, one has to be very circumspective about this because your inclusion criteria in the studies that do these things and um, the patients you're going to do a TDR on are probably more likely not to have degeneration. You know, they've got a single level disease. I want to go play golf. So you're banging a TDR as opposed to old black with multi-level disease. So, you know, as I said, these are not great papers, but it does seem to come through that if there's ongoing motion, it's less likely that you're going to get uh, adjacent segment degeneration. So... And um, this, there's a few studies. Uh, this is this interesting paper, this guy who looked at, because one of the criticisms of total disc replacements is they end up fusing. So what this guy did is he looked at his total disc replacements and he compared those that moved by more than five degrees and those that moved by less than five. Now, if you don't move by five degrees and basically you've got a fusion and you can see that he claims, which is um, a bit unbelievable, but he had zero, zero uh, degenerative changes if there was more than five degrees of motion. If, and if his disc replacement fused, he had about a third of his patients developed adjacent segment degeneration. So anyway, you can just understand there that if you, have, if you have ongoing motion, your stresses at the high level are less, and it probably won't degenerate as quickly. Okay. Uh, I don't think we need to worry too much about that or that. The important thing, though, is just to avoid a facet violation, as I said, at the super end of your construct. Aim for sagittal alignment. I mean, it's, I think there's many reasons why we need to consider sagittal alignment when we do fusion surgery and if possible maintain motion and um, you know we would if we could the lumbar spine uh, disc replacements have been a bit disappointing but in the cervical spine we well my my default is a disc replacement um don't worry about too much like that so here's an example of somebody that had super jason degeneration here she had a very old construct which is fixed in a very flat Format. This is your Steffi plates. If you ever see them, hopefully you never see them because it'll take you about a week in theater to get them out. And um, she's had a PSO and got it upright, and, and that's how we would deal with her. So we would approach her by extending the fusion, decompressing the adjacent segment, and restoring the sagittal alignment so she can stand up. And just remember, yeah, not only has she got a flat back, but she's fully compensating with a flat thoracic spine, flexing her hips and knees to stay relatively erect. You can imagine. If she straightened her hips and knees, she'd be pointing even more um, forward. So, and there we've got now a reasonable lumbar lordosis. She's developed a little bit of a thoracic kyphosis again. And, uh, well, that's not fantastic, uh, but her legs are straight. So that would be the thing. All right. So um, I'm going to skip past that. I'm just repeating myself, I think. But I've got, I just want to end off with these cases just to summarize uh, where we are. I think I've only given 
two of them out in the last two. I'm just going to run through. You know, who's got four? Benjamin. I've got four. Uh, Peter. Who's it? Peter, Peter. How's yes, my prof. patient? Perfect, Prof. Okay, thank you. He was eating a sausage and moving his moving the, Is he moving his legs, more importantly? <laughs> yes, he was. Okay. That was an unnecessary scare. Uh, okay. Is it this one, Peter? Yes, Prof. Okay, I don't recall it. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so I just got your older patient with stenosis and dysthesis, undergoes decompression and fusion. There's the MRI scan. What do you see on the MRI, Peter? Prof, on the MRI, um... On the sagittals, I mean, it was a mid-sagittal, but like, you can see there's generalized disc desiccation, uh, degenerative change throughout, but um, most importantly, at the super adjacent level to where her um, fusion was at 4.5. Um, but you can still, when, when you look at the axial, uh, I think that was the, the bottom one. Um, it didn't really show that there's any violation of the canal or any compression. Yeah cord itself yeah. um, so just the big thing you can see here is that severe foraminal stenosis there hey? so that's yeah. what you often see at an adjacent segment level with lateral recess and it's foraminal stenosis okay when you see yeah. that it usually drives you to needing a foraminal decompression and an interbody so the patient came back I, I, I wasn't managing the patient at this point um, this was being managed by someone else so She's had one operation. So you can see here, when you talk about a failed back, so we think about failed backs now, and you've got a patient, the question is whether, you know, the correct operation was done because yeah. she's got a degenerative scoliosis. She's had an easy operation. So maybe just tailored the surgeon tailored to what he could do. She comes back, she's got quite miserable foraminal stenosis and say has another go. And you can see that he's now uh, performed this. And she, this is when she came to me with a progressive missed cervical lumbar back pain, unable to walk fast. What do you think about this? So, Prof, I think that um, on looking looking at her, she she looks like she has a flat back with, and she's got um, positive sagittal balance. So she's, but she's sagittally and coronally Im, um, imbalanced. Um, and if you look at her pelvis, just on the X-rays on the left, um, that the um, pelvic inlet um, is narrowed, which could be an indication of um, you know, pelvic retroversion, which could be uh, for just compensating. I mean, on mm -hmm. the left, you see that she, she's she um, got loss of her kyphosis and she's almost hyperextending her neck, the hyperlordosis of her neck, and almost no lordosis of her lower, of her lumbar spine. Um, which is quite, um, it's, it's all one straight line which contributes to her flat back. So she's, she's trying to compensate where she's standing there now, but she is obviously fatiguing because she's holding down onto her legs as well. Yeah, exactly. So what did you offer her? So Prof, you need to, um, you need to address the, the lumbar lordosis. Um, so you have to take into account the um, pelvic incidence. I think that was on the slide after this one. Um, yeah, that's so, so yeah, so this is not a central balance talk, but you need to whenever you think about a patient, you need to think about their pelvic incision. You have to, it has to be big or small, basically, but you take the center of the femoral head to the center to the uh, perpendicular from the sacrum and you measure this angle, and that's the patient's pelvic characteristic. And she's got quite a big one. You see it's approaching 90 yeah. degrees. I think the average is about 50, so she's a high. And the implication is that if you've got a high pelvic incidence, you need a high lumbar lordosis to stay upright. That's right, sure. You know, there's a mismatch. And so unfortunately, this previous surgeon didn't realize that. And that's why the first operation was doomed to failure because yeah. you can see over here, there's a massive pelvic incidence. He hasn't sorted it out. He should have put it into body there to jack it up. And um, now he's basically fixed her L4-5 in kyphosis because uh, it should be 20 to 30 degrees. The problem is, is two thirds of your lumbar lordosis is between L4 and S1. You can see over here, uh, four to S1 is basically zero. This is a woman's in trouble, yeah. So that was a pelvic incidence. And then what did we do? Uh, Prof, so um, from what I, so there was, it was obviously a revision and a, um, 
I thought it was T10 to S1, um, uh, antibody fusion with a um, L5S1 um, cage with a posterior osteotomy done at L3, which I thought was a PSO. It was, yeah. So, she, so I did it some time years ago. I, I wouldn't do the, exactly the same style now because I generally would put antibody. You, you tend to have a high failure rate. This woman actually was fine. Luckily, she fused, but um, often what happens is you've probably got about a 40% chance of non-union and rod breakage. So I tend to tee lift above and below the osteotomy now, but for those who don't recognize this, we've changed the shape from a square vertebra to a triangular vertebra, and we've brought her back into lordosis, and that's what I've done, and I've done, I've supported it. So today I do things a little bit differently. I did it probably about 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, but I would go into the pelvis to give a good foundation. I would double rod over the L4 file, over the osteotomy. I do the osteotomy at L4 now because I, you get more correction the lower you yeah. are. And, but anyway, I mean, she turned out quite well and we got her up. Um, actually, this is here. I said it's more than 10 years ago because that's my Constantia Berg rooms, which I left 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, so, but she did well. So that's, but the point here is that. The PI wasn't picked up. The whole uh, there was a misunderstanding or a, a poor appreciation of the underlying issues, and she needed a, a massive reconstruction. She never was never going to do well with a single level osteotomy or a single level fusion. Yeah. Did she need this from the beginning, bro? This yeah, was I think so. Yeah, I think so. I don't think that four five was ever an issue. Though. I don't think four five was ever going to do the operation. It was all or nothing, unfortunately. Sometimes it's like that. You can't just do an operation that you can do. You know, sometimes you've got to say, "This is what the patient needs. I need to pass it on." You know. So but the that is tempting. They come to a little bit of stenosis, and you think, "Ah, oh, well, I'll just do that." But I mean, it's just unless it's just a decompression. But to go and fuse her in that fixed position, it was never going to work. Yeah. I, I, is there a protest from the ladies tonight? I just see no Lunga, no Francis, no Cindy. Who's Galaxy Note? Is it, a, is it a, I'm one there, of them? I'm, I'm Galaxy. Where's Lunga? Is that Galaxy Note 8? Yes, yes. Are you on a pseudonym? Ah, okay. You're lucky as a party to email the dean. Okay. Don't say I don't care, Dr. Lunga. Um, Never. Okay, all right, so let's go to case five. Is it Benjamin's got case five? I haven't heard from him tonight yet. Hi, Prof. I'm here. I've just got load shedding, so. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's an old excuse. You've got to find a new one. <laughs> but I'm here. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to put case five on. Um, is it late onset back pain? Yes. Okay. So 70-year-old, low back pain, bilateral stenotic symptoms. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I think that's the operation she had. Okay, it's not the greatest. X-ray is a bit grainy. But by six months, she had a slight forward list. By one year, increasing list. This is what happens, Benjamin. So you're just going to go back to Ghana. You're going to think you're the big shake there. And uh, you're going to do an operation like this, and you're going to think, yeah, what a fantastic operation. You won't even see the slightly long rod because you're so chuffed with this that you got all your screws <laughs> in, the patient didn't die. And uh, this is what happens in life. So you're always chuffed. And then you'd, only after life, after a few years of this job, you start to realize, actually, that's not a great operation. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and then life proves that to you because by six months, she's got this forward list again. And by one yeah. year, she's got an increasing list in lumbar sacral pain. And this is an x-ray. So what's going on? Prof, um, I can see a slight progressive lisp on L4, L5 uh, with uh, lysis around the screws, uh, the most distal screws. So my suspicion is uh, she may have inf uh, developed an inf a deep-seated infection. Uh, with loosening of the screws, uh, that's uh, distal screws. Okay, so you picked up the problem. She's got loose L5, sorry, loose S1 screws. S1 so you know, she might have infection. Um, it'd be unusual to have infection that only affects a single level. Um, usually, yeah. if you get infection, it usually track up and you may well see it causing lysis. It's possible, though. But let's just say the CRP is five, white cell counts normal. What else could it be? Uh, could be um, aseptic loosening, meaning um, 
possibly a lot of strain on that S1 screw. So adjacent segment disease or um, quite a bit of motion. Uh, this yeah, thing. so I mean, we'd call it a non-union. Eh? So an L5 is one non-union. And that's often yeah. what happens. So you can imagine this. I mean, this was not a good operation by myself. I, I was happy with it, but I've learned a lot since. I, I, you know, by those days we were teaching ourselves. There was nobody really teaching us. We had to make all our own mistakes. There's nobody really doing spines that we could learn from. And uh, we were taught to go down to S1, but, mm. it, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. You go because S1 is a relatively soft bone. And yeah. so you have this, the, what happens very quickly, you get fusion in the proximal area. You've got this long lever arm that's pivoting down there and you get a non union. That's what happens. So, what would you say? It is. Okay. This is a, Non-union non with loose instrumentation, okay. which is terrible because every time they stand up, you can imagine those screws just poke in the back of the sacrum. It's mm -hmm. extremely painful because there's a non-union, there's ongoing motion, L5 is one, but the rest yeah. of the construct is very well fixed. So every time she moves, the rest of her spine just pivots those things in and out, and it's extremely painful. So what are you going to do? Um, I think maybe to uh, revise and then um, extend the fusion down to the pelvis. Yeah, exactly. Hey, so, I mean, again, this this operation was about 15 years ago. So the, it's, um, that's exactly what I've done. I've probably changed the thickness, the, the diameter of the, of the S. In this case, I've put uh, pelvic screws into the, into the pelvis. So today, I, if I, well, when I do an operation like this, from the outset, if I'm doing a long lumbar fusion, I will put, say, Benjamin, can you hear me? Hello, Prof. I, I'm, 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 I got lost there. Um, yeah, I, I think I, think I, I, lost I, I, I disappeared. Yeah, I disappeared. I don't know oh. where I lost you, but the, the, I just repeat that is that in to, today, if I ever do an operation like this, I would automatically use pelvic support for a long fusion like okay. this. So I okay. would, and my preference currently is a S2 AI screw. So, but this patient was revised with pelvic screws. Uh, revised S S1 screws and she actually got a very good result after that. So the point was here was a failure of surgical decision making. I shouldn't have ever stopped at S1. It's historical, but um, you know our fellows all get taught that that's not not how you do it now. Mm. Okay. okay, okay. Thanks, that's Benjamin. Nice. Thanks, Prof. Uh, then just the last two cases. Um, Brad, you're keeping up. Yeah, I'm here, bro. Okay, just checking, just checking. Um, close top back pain. Yeah, you know, I can't remember these. I'm just going to go with it. So 66-year-old, low back pain, bilateral L5 pain, little emotionally fragile. Oh, yeah, okay, got it now, got it now. Yeah. She was a retired ballerina brought in by her two daughters. Um a little bit all over the place, dyed her hair red. Um, so anyway, she she had this operation, and Dr. Polly always tells me that my three-level T-lifts never work. I think I proved him wrong, but I mean, he obviously has a reason for saying that, and um, so obviously they don't work very often, but um, you can see that I've gone and done three-level T-lift here. I managed to roll that cage in a bit skew. On its own, it's not a big problem. Looking pretty reasonable, although if you draw the angles, probably not as much low doses as I would have liked. I probably should have compressed down here a bit, but anyway, everything looks okay. Surgical admission, 14 days, which is having a long, but I remember she wouldn't go home. She was slow to mobilize. She had poor home support, which only came out there with a whole big mess. It was a bit of a sort of husband, a sort of estranged husband scenario I wasn't aware about. Um, I sent her to step down where she fell and had increasing pain, and she irritated the shit out of me. So... Another lesson, when patients irritate you, it doesn't mean they don't have a real problem. And I remember she, I was being hassled by her daily and by her daughters and drove me nuts. And eventually, they admit, I said, just admit it back to Constantia Berg. And I, I had an x-ray and I read the report, which said, no complication. And I stomped into a room and without asking anything, I just said, like, why are you back here? Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I then Carl took a breath. And I went and looked at the x ray and I felt very embarrassed. You can see why I'm embarrassed. 
Brad. Prof, the thing that's standing out to me there is the um, superior end plate of L3. Exactly. What's that? It's a fracture. Um, the fracture. Yeah. So she fractured. But now if you fracture there, that's not just an end plate fracture. What that is, is a pedicle fracture. And when you x-ray, when you CT scan these things, the bloody, there'll be a split through this pedicle all the way here. So actually that screw is no longer holding that vertebra very well. It's not just an end plate fracture. It's just, it, it's, when you CT, the fracture goes through there and it, that superior half, the pedicle is actually lifting off. So every time she flexes, she's pulling that whole half the pedicle and piece up with her. Okay, she's agonizing. Again, I've had more than one of these, and I'm not sure if it's due to my distraction with the T lift. I've now got a much, but I used to really wind into those T lift distractors, and now I've stopped doing that because you can imagine when you've got your screws in here and you put a T lift distractor and you wind in that maybe that screw pushes right up there and it puts that top one, makes it vulnerable. These are not a stress because they're in with, within the fusion mass, but obviously. After the operation, the whole body is pulling on that disc and that facet joint. So if there was a crack, it's gone. Anyway, so um, I thought, I'd, you know, she just drove me nuts. This woman, you can see here's the fracture. You can see the fracture through there. So the thing gone right through, you've got to imagine it's like a half a fracture. It's a coronal split right through the vertebra. That whole top section's loose. And I thought I could treat it non-operatively. I tried. It didn't work. Look what happened. Miserable. Um, so I had to go back and uh, you see she became kyphotic. She moaned and moaned and moaned about this bump over here until I did something about it. And then I did a double level osteotomy. You see all my planning stuff. We can also plan in spinal surgery, use software, which um, I apply the cuts and then I push a button and it gives me something to do. And then uh, you can see what I've done there. I've done an osteotomy to correct her, did another through the fracture area. I put a T-lip there and I've recreated it um the, the low doses and so on anyway she was really happy believe it or not after that i was really surprised actually. actually all along it was my um i wasn't listening to my patients so just uh, be very careful when anybody patients really irritating you just be careful they don't have uh, real pathology and look out for those subtle little fractures and don't believe radiology reports um and then last case that i've got um Case seven, which is a disaster, a very sad case. And this is really just to summarize, um, failed back for you and hopefully make you think about this. And this could be a hip, it could be a knee, it could be anything. Um, in terms of just, uh, you know, people not thinking and just doing one thing after the other without really taking a big, uh, broad view on things. So I just call this young disaster. So I met this lady in 2006. She was 20 years old. Her parents had got hold of me somehow on the internet and they were desperate. The history was that she swam competitively. She swam for South Africa against Australia from the age of nine years old. I think I forget when it was, but she went to Australia just to represent our country at high school. She developed low back pain from about 11 uh, at her 18th matric dance, she got up to dance, experienced acute severe low back pain, was put on medication, X-rays, MRI, epidural with no effect, never got rid of that pain. She saw a neurosurgeon in 2004 in Johannesburg, where she lived. She had a four-level discogram, which is when they inject the discs with something to see if it's painful. And they judge this to be L5S1 being the most painful. Now, if you can imagine, if you inject any disc, it's going to be bloody painful. To now decide which one is uh, pathologically painful. It's been well shown that the discogram is unable to do that. So anyway, it was all bullshit that was done. And then in July, 2004, in an 18 year old, underwent an L5 S1 disc replacement. She was better for about a week and they developed right calf pain and adopted that forward flex position um, for some time. She couldn't stand up. They used to, she used to call it her flamingo leg. She'd have to stand on one leg. She couldn't bear weight on the, on the leg. Um, she went back to the neurosurgeon. Uh, for some reason, he now decided the problem was no longer L5S1 and he thought it was L2, 3. So he uh, did a T lift. He then cultured staph from the disc, put on vancomycin, but she was allergic to this somehow. Rifampicin. She was straight up for two weeks, then the pain as before, back to a forward flex position. She was bed bound by the time they got hold of me two years later. 
sitting limited to five minutes, walking a few meters, she was 20 at the time, leaves the house in a stretcher, and she had severe back and right leg calf pain. So when I, I actually flew up to go see her, they couldn't fly down to see me. Um, she was tender from L3 to L5. She had reduced L5 and S1 sensation on the right. She had right sciatica on extending, straightening the spine and a straight leg raise with paresthesia into the haddix. So this is what the x-rays looked like. You can see very odd shaped vertebra, typical of Sherman's, unfortunately commonly seen in these people that swim like crazy. She got a big disc replacement there, which I think in retrospect, well, in retrospect, I thought at the time, they caused hyperlordosis and segment, closing down the facet joint and foramen stenosis. So I think that's part of the problem. That's why she wanted to flex herself always forward to try and open up the nerves. She had a solid fusion at two, three, where you did that operation. Um, and you can, this was the MRI scan. So believe it or not, I mean, she couldn't stand up. She had incredible pain. And after discussing her very widely, um, they'll probably go to hell for this. So I did a T10 to S1 fusion in 2006. Okay, so again, S1 is a bad choice. But in 2006, that's what we did for some reason. I did L3 PSA, even though today we do L4. And I distracted L5 S1 where I thought the bramal stenosis was. So we got this again, Benjamin, I was very proud of this for, the, for that stage of our lives. That was something we were proud of. Uh, but mm -hmm. quite clearly, I mean, I haven't got very good lordosis. My fix into S1, although it was okay, it was not brilliant. Um, I should be in the pelvis. But you can see, of course, distraction. The disc replacements opened up. There's some foraminal opening. And, if, and I did my PSO, which is not the best, but it's probably the second one I ever did. Um, but she was actually surprisingly better. She was able to stand erect, no leg pain, walked unaided by day two. Funny enough, she developed a C7 radicular pain. Um, she had had it before. She was reassured. I thought it was just the position during the operation. She was still there at six weeks, MRI normal, EMG confirmed a break of plexus neuritis. But just amazing how this woman's bitch got such bad luck, you know? Anyway, it settled eventually. Six months later, and this, this is the story. This, these patients keep recurring in terms of their um, pathology. Just every time you think you've won, um, it comes back. Now, what have I done Sorry, lost it. There we go. Ah. Oh, sorry, I'm not seeing that thing anymore. Are you guys still seeing six months later? Yeah. Oh, okay, I've got it. I've got it now. Okay, let's come back. Um, six months later, increasing right L5 and S1 regular pain. I did epidural, any transient pain control. And she's now in Joburg, again. it says up and down, up and down, driving me nuts. I did a CT myelogram, no ongoing ev uh, compression evidence. Thought maybe there's ongoing motion from the pro disc. Um, spoke to da uh, David Welsh about it. So we decided, you know, thought there was some lucency around the S1 screw. I thought there was motion on the flexing extension views, convinced ourselves. Um, so what we did, took it back to theater, removed the pro disc from the front, which is a, a very risky operation, but we managed to do it. Small common iliac vein tear repaired, propaned in the ALIF. Post S1 screws were found to be loose, replaced. I found a right L5 S1 facet, osteophyte compressing the roots, convinced myself, regrafted, immediate resolution leg pain, mobilized and discharged. So you can see there, nice big ALIF. So we're just hammering on, hammering on. Think, wow, we've won now. She's doing well. Mm. All well, July 2007, think we've won. Get an email, good few months, already lost, done an A-levels, can't, can't gain the university, everything's going fantastically well. My biggest worry is that my right leg's been playing up by the November. You can just see the same thing. So this sense of failure, this low uh, tolerance of pain or low threshold. Um, again, battling, battling, battling. Um, did some imaging. Thought there was, I think they thought there was motion. So what I did in 2008, so I explored out of desperation. The family think you're the only guy that can do something up and down from Joburg. And I went, explored the nerve roots, found all of a scar. <clears throat> I put an epidural in. So I actually put an epidural in for five days. And we did mobilization to try and stretch your nerve in within the scar. You can see we could get almost 90 degree straight leg raise while the epidural was there. She went back. She got some distinction. She sends me a picture of her advice. She's standing up doing well. I think we've won. Four months later, it starts again. So it goes, you know, failed back. Um, and then uh, things aren't really going. I'm trying to withdraw here, but it's like very difficult. Uh, some recurrence, consulted, neurosurgeon pain position, acute back pain five months later. X-rays in February 2014. I can't actually remember what I, why I'm showing these X-rays. Um, 
And we, I went to Debride the Scar once again. We got a durotomy, then she was mobilizing again, and then she went home and, in fact, started su suing the first surgeon from 2004. And she's been pretty much hobbling along since then. So I just want to show you that she pretty much sums up a failed case. Um, and it was all started with probably inappropriate operation at the age of 20. But once you get going, you can't stop. So this sort of summarizes um, how these patients end up with failed back. That's uh, all I have for you. And I'm open for questions if you would um, like to ask any.